At 21, Susan Atkins would become the most visible member of a ragtag bunch of killers, the Manson family. A one-time nice little kid as she grew up in Northern California, Susan became a popular babysitter, captained her school swimming team, and sang in the church choir. Then when her mother died, Susan Atkins ran away from home, and she fell in with a dangerous little man who would spend virtually his whole life in jails. And so at 18, Susan Atkins became one of Charlie's girls, as they were called, one of the first. More would join her, and in time, all of them would develop a fanatical loyalty to Charles Manson, nurtured by his persuasiveness and hyped by the unrelenting use of drugs. So after 300 LSD trips in two years, when Manson sent Susan Atkins and others of his family to kill, they did it. Later, looking, sounding, and acting crazy, Susan Atkins would spill it all and tell a grand jury what happened. With terrible detail, she would describe how she murdered movie actress Sharon Tate and her yet unborn baby, and then participated in the murder of four others on that hot summer's night at the actress's Hollywood home. Susan Atkins is 28 now. She's just ended her first seven years of a life term. She has spent five of them here at the California Women's Institution in San Bernardino County. She's just had her first parole hearing and been turned down. But the people who work with her here say that she's made a remarkable change in the last two years. They say she's become a devout Christian, and she says she wants only to serve God. Susan Atkins feels that her horrifying experience with drugs can be a lesson to those that use them or think about using them. She hasn't spoken with a reporter since the trial in 1970. She got word to me that she wanted to talk about the dangers of drug use, that she also wanted to reveal something new about the murders. What happened that night you all went to Sharon Tate's house? What really happened? Well, I remember getting in the car with Tex and... Tex my, Watson. Tex Watson and my other two co-defendants, three co-defendants, actually. Um, and before I ever got in the car, Tex and I had our own special little stash of uh, cocaine. You know, I think it was cocaine or methadrine, I'm not sure which. We were with speed and we both snorted some speed and got in the car. We were very, very wired. Mm. And we drove to the house uh, with instructions to kill everyone in the house. From Charlie? Yeah. Um, and not just that but that we were instructed to go all the way down every house, hit every house on the... On the street? On the street, yes. And kill all the people kill in those houses? all the people in all those houses. Um, and we went into the house, and I remember that... As we went in, uh, a car came up to the driveway and I remember Tex getting out, and without saying anything, they were gunned by a sh shot. I was in the bushes, and... Uh, That's when the young boy, Stephen Parent, was, right, killed, was killed in the right. car outside. Right. Um, the people in the house were all brought into the living room and tied up, and I remember that Wojtek Bakowski, I believe is his name. I had tied his hands with a towel and then was instructed to kill him. And I raised the knife that I had in my hand and I couldn't put the knife down. I, I, could not, I couldn't bring it down. It was just as though there was a force there that held my wrist and I couldn't, I couldn't move. And as he saw that I couldn't move, then he very easily undid the ties the towel that I'd tied his wrist with, and he and I began to fight. And I remember I was screaming for help, and he was screaming for help, and uh, then Tex came and helped me, and I was left to sit and watch Sharon Tate. And about that time, it, all I can remember seeing is people just scattering in different places and running in different places, and I was left sitting with Sharon Tate, and she was talking to me, and. I remember that I had absolutely, I could have, I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing for her um, as she begged 
for her life and for the life of her baby. And, uh, Jesus. I remember when we first went in, uh, one of the people said, who are you? And Tex said, I'm the devil, and I'm here to do the devil's business. And I remember that in my conscience, it, it's so alive in me, even just recalling it, I remember that I had gone so far and there was no turning back. There, even if I had wanted to run, even if I had wanted to leave, I couldn't. It was like I was caught in something that I had no control over. I had absolutely no say-so as to what was happening there. I was just like a tool in the hands of the devil is the only way I can put it. And I believe that it was by the grace of God that my hand did not go down with that knife on Wojciech Vajkowski's chest. I believe that... Uh, So who did kill those people? That night? Yeah. Tex. During her trial in 1970 and 71, she seemed a horrifying combination of confused little girl and cold-blooded murderer. And like all of the others in the Manson family, Susan Atkins' loyalty to the man who led her life where it went was absolute. So when Charles Manson shaved his hair off, she did too. And then, just as he had done, she and her co-defendants all carved X's into their foreheads. Today, she says her bizarre behavior was born out of Manson's evil persuasiveness and fed by her constant drug use. During her Manson years, Susan Atkins dropped acid at least 300 times, and she smoked, swallowed, shot up, and snorted every other drug in sight. And although she had no drugs in her first five years of imprisonment, she says it took her that long to fully regain her consciousness, to even begin to realize what she had done. All of the LSD, all of the other drugs had put her in a fog, which she didn't begin to come out of until two years ago. Um, you'd have to understand what acid does to the mind in order to understand how a person can get confused behind drugs. And that's, I would take a thesis writing a book on what LSD can do to the mind. But, um, but it was powerful enough to keep you sure, in a fog for sure. all those years, even after you sure. stopped I used using. To, I used to think that you came down off an acid trip after 12 hours. That's not true. Every time you take LSD, you, uh, your conscious level rises or expands, and your, the moral fiber of your character, which is in, uh, put in you or... Uh, when you grow up, everybody grows up with different morals according to their culture. Okay, when you take acid, your mind expands beyond these moral characteristics and your concepts of right and wrong. So you step out beyond those bounds, and when you step out beyond those bounds, the imagination begins to take over. And the imagination can be a very deceitful thing. It, it's a fantasy. And when you take acid, you go out beyond that. You think you're coming back to where you started from. Originally, you don't. And every time you drop acid, you get a little bit further away from reality. And I took so much acid that I just was what I would term spaced. And it took me many years to what I term now re-enter. And that was just through not having any acid and having to deal with reality every day. Well, you say you're operating from a sense of complete consciousness now and reality. Then looking back from this point for you, what you were and what you did must be terrifying. Yes, to realize that by my own free will, I willingly got into something that completely took control over me, that I lost control of myself behind drugs and... Um, De a process of deprogramming, losing my morals. It wasn't just drugs, it was Charles Manson's persuasiveness, too. Well, yeah, there was a lot of deprogramming that went in, that was involved in that. Uh, 
you take away a person's conscience of right and wrong by telling them when they're under LSD or any mind expanding drug, there's no such thing as guilt. And you've already come to a place in your mind or your imagination where uh, you don't like the feeling of guilt. So it's easy to say, yeah, there's no such thing as guilt. I'll believe there's no such thing as guilt. Therefore, I can do anything and not feel guilty about it. Can you understand why many people, perhaps most people outside, are going to feel that you don't deserve parole, that you should never be given parole? You're aware of that? Yes. Well, so what if you spend the rest of your life in this prison? Then I spend the rest of my life in this prison. Um, Is that thought depressing to you, though? No, because I know that, um, how can I put it? I'm content. I have found peace inside, and it does not, it's not determined by my situation or my circumstance or my physical surroundings. How's it come about? How does peace come about, my peace? Mm -hmm. Well, I found peace through salvation in Jesus. And just knowing that I've been forgiven by God is sufficient for me. And the fact that you know out there people probably can't forgive you. Yes. Has, has no effect on you? Um, no. Uh, because they're not the ones that I have to face in the end when I die. I have to face God, and it's His forgiveness that determines my peace. At 21, Susan Atkins was center stage in the crime of the century. Now, seven years later, she says her life has come to a better purpose. Without that, she probably wouldn't have lived. Or as a reporter wrote during the trial, Susan Atkins looked like she might start screaming someday and never stop. Well, I can ask you now, what, what did Tex really do there? I, what, do you, what did you observe? Yeah, ...of what I saw happening in Tex, the way he moved, the viciousness and cold um, It was just like seeing somebody go crazy with more power than I've ever seen anybody. I don't think he was in control of himself. I think that he was in control of... Uh in their own human strength could do what Tex did. Well, Charles night. Manson was in control of him, right? Yeah, as far as giving orders, but I don't think Charles Manson's mind was in control of Tex's mind that night. I think that it was a higher power than that. Charlie's human, too, you know, and his mental uh, powers are just as limited, maybe not as limited as other humans, but that there was an evil force in control of Tex that night. Well, it was in control he, of all of you, yeah, obviously. He, yeah, he did things that... You've heard stories, I'm sure, of people who have lifted up cars off of other people, how they have superhuman strength. Well, Tex had that kind of strength that night. Uh, but not for good, it was for evil. It's harming and hurting people. Just to be able I only saw him kill those people, and then I've heard later that he has said himself that he was responsible for all the deaths. At the Tate House? At the Tate House, yes. Are you trying to lay the blame off on him? No. No. Then what exactly. do you think is the point of this? That the truth be told, that the truth be made known. I try to take blame from Tex and from Charlie and from Pat and from Leslie by taking and saying that I had killed Sharon Tate and that I had killed Gary Hinman. I tried to take some of the blame and put it on myself because I thought that was my part at that point, and that was a lie. 
And in this room, we're all the survivors of those victims, of yours and the others, their families and their friends. What would you say to them? Well, about me now is that I'm not the woman that I was in 1969. I'm a new creature in Christ. Uh, I've been completely spiritually, mentally, and almost physically born again, though my outside is not changed all that much. The inside of me has changed. Uh, that I love them with a love that I don't think any words that I could tell them could express, but only by living a life that may help somebody else by preventing maybe somebody else from going down the same road, by preventing other survivors of such a terrible thing is the only way that I could say what I would have to say to them. I just love them. I feel for them. I feel their pain. I feel their, their sorrows and, and their loss. And I didn't feel that years ago. I didn't feel anything for them. But today, I do feel pain when I think about her and that she's not here. And I don't think that anything that I could say could ease that pain in any of the survivors' hearts. And only God can take care of that. Only God can give them an assurance that their loved ones are with him. And I believe that with my whole heart. I believe that those people that died that night are with God and that they're at peace and that's the only thing that I can tell them. And I believe that with my whole heart. And that by the grace of God, the survivors will also see their loved ones again.